Lung cancer screenings can they save your life? I talked with top insider Dr. Mark Zalewski, and here's what he had to say. Tell us about the importance of the screenings. I feel like we can't emphasize this enough. Well, we have known for many years, more than four decades, that um, we can identify patients at risk. Right. Um, and those are the patients that would benefit from a program like a CT screening program. And smoking, as we talked about in the earlier segment, is a primary risk factor. It's easy to identify someone who has been a smoker. The trouble we have is identifying patients with other risk factors, and right. we mentioned a couple of those. Asbestos is an occupational exposure. Many people that were working with asbestos may not even know that they were have been exposed to it. Radon is a, is a nuclear particle that's in the soil, and someone's house or may have been built over a radon prevalent area, and they may, may have been exposed as a, as a young boy or a, a child and may not even know it. Right. So those are the patients that are difficult to identify. Family uh, members who've prior had cancer, people who are non-smokers, we know 15 to 17 percent of patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer are non-smokers. So what caused their wow. cancer? So we do think that there's a genetic link to it, and it's very difficult to identify those patients are at, who are at risk. When you can identify those patients that are at risk, are they usually going to see their primary care physician to get these screenings, or does a primary care physician say, hey, I'm going to send you so that you can get additional testing done? So nowadays, we've had a number of studies that have demonstrated there's a benefit to lung screening. And most right. primary care physicians realize that um, screening their high-risk patient populations, those smokers, um, mm -hmm. uh, is beneficial. So most primary care or pulmonary medicine or internal medicine doctors are now identifying those patients at risk and referring them or at least having a conversation with the patient about getting a CT scan for screening purposes. Now a low dose CT scan is often used to detect cancer and we have a video that explains more on that. Let's take a look. Low dose CT is something that is, is relatively new. Uh, it's something we're promoting because it provides, unlike traditional CTs out there, it's 90% less radiation than a traditional CT. The scan is very quick. Um, we take those images from the scan and we composite an image of the lungs itself so that we can look for pulmonary nodules or masses that have developed over time. It's designed for those individuals that have a history of excessive smoking or have uh, uh, smoked one pack a day for the past 30 years, basically, or those that haven't quit in the last 15 years. Um, it's also to screen those individuals that have a high risk and to screen them every year to see if they have changed during that time. Lung cancer, if, if present, moves, can move pretty quickly and sometimes it's too late to do anything. So the earlier the better with these. I like this option, Doc. So then let's reaffirm again who needs to go get screened. What, what, what are those specifications that we're looking for? So the research that's been done on lung screening to use it in the most effective a way, cost-effective way, and efficient way, they've identified potential risks of, of patients. And patients who are offered lung screening should meet these criteria, right. which is basically a heavy history of smoking. Okay, um, either a current smoker that has smoked more than 10 years or a smoker who quit in less than the right. past 15 years. Now, there's an arbitrary age cutoff uh, for that. We, we, it's been cut off at 55 because the data has shown that you know, patients who've been a smoker, whether they started earlier in their years, at age 55, the risks start to increase. And then the cutoff for year 80 is because most smokers have died from other diseases before they're 80. Right. Um, if they make it to 80, then and they haven't gotten cancer at age 80, they're unlikely to, to get cancer. And if they do get cancer, they're likely to succumb to some other disease other than the cancer that they've de developed at age 80. So the data has demonstrated that the most cost-effective way of using lung screening is in this patient population. Right. Now, if you are just tuning in, Dr. Deluski has spoken about the lung screening program at Baptist, which is free of charge, correct? Absolutely. It's a, it's a, a byproduct of a patient of mine and a donor 
uh, at Baptist named Dennis Bookchester who provided the initial resources and the funding to get this program going. And surprisingly, the program has been one of the mo most robust programs in the That's United amazing. States. We've screened, I think the numbers are up around 6,000 patients and it's only about three years old, three or four years old. That is unbelievable. Now, if you have a question on lung cancer screenings, you can call in and ask Dr. Jalewski a question. The toll-free number is 855-796-4475. Okay, so let's say lung cancer is detected, doctor. Now, what's the next? What's the next step in the diagnostic process? Is it straight to treatment or? So, you know, lung screening. It's interesting. If you diagnose someone with pulmonary a pulmonary nodule, we don't know whether it's cancer or not. Okay. Uh, based just because the patient has an abnormal CT scan, so we have to have a you know a physician such as a pulmonologist or a thoracic surgeon or even radiologist evaluate the CT scan and see if there are certain criteria. Um, namely the risks that the patient has for lung cancer and then there's characteristic findings on the CAT scan that would give you some idea that this is a cancer and if it does look like it's a cancer you should pursue it um, with further investigation okay. either a biopsy sometimes a PET scan which is a different type of scan that can will, you explain what the PET scan well, is? Well, the PET scan is, a, is like a CT scan but what the difference is is they give the patient a sugar molecule with a nuclear particle and we know that cancer or any rapidly dividing cell in the body will absorb glucose and okay. try to utilize it so it concentrates this this, this glucose molecule inside the cells of the cancer. And then when you scan the patient, you can see that it lights up in certain spots of the body. And that may tell you some information to clue you into whether this is a cancer or whether it's an inflammatory nodule. Wow, okay. Now, when it comes to treating cancer, there are a number of different options available, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, just to <coughs> name a few. So can you tell us about this multi, like this multidisciplinary approach that happens at the Miami Cancer Institute to treat a patient with the best outcomes? So Kathy, remember I told you that the majority of people who are diagnosed with lung cancer today is in the advanced stages, right. stage two, two and three, three four. and four. So the majority of folks that come in are going to need some sort of multimodality therapy for their treatment of lung cancer. What that means is it may be a combination of chemotherapy, which is a medication they give through the vein, radiation, which is type of x-ray that they give to the tumor, mm -hmm. and then surgery. Now, we know that patients with early stage cancer, the best impact that the patient, or the best chance that the patient has for cure is to have it surgically removed, okay? Okay. Um, when you start to talk about using a combination of therapies, you're trying to impact the tumor to try to downstage the tumor in order to get rid of it or to be able to effectively downstage it so that we can surgically remove it. And here's a fun fact for you. There's actually a type of lung surgery named after Dr. Deluski himself. Isn't that cool? You can learn about it by downloading our app and watching his complete interview.